Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here in person and virtually. I really appreciate all the support. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Olivia Anderson, and I had the honor this summer to work with Colorado Natural Heritage Program on the All of That Pocket Mouse Project. And I have a lot of content to cover, so I'm going to go right into it. So our agenda for the day, I'm going to start out with a little bit about Colorado Natural Heritage Program. I'll probably abbreviate that to CNHP. The study purpose are socio-ecological contexts about um, peregrinesis fasciitis or the olive pocket mouse. I may also abbreviate that to OBPM. And then I'll go into the methods, results of what happened, discussions, observations, limitations of the study, conclusions, and what um, I think are some good recommendations, deliverable, personal reflections, and um, plenty of acknowledgments and questions, of course. So who is Colorado Natural Heritage Program? So CNHP's mission is to advance the conservation of Colorado's native species and ecosystems through science, planning, and education for the benefit of current and future generations. CNHP is a nonprofit, non-academic institution of Colorado State University's Warner College of Natural Resources. Colorado Natural Heritage Program was first created in 1979. It was then known as the Colorado Natural Features Inventory. And since then, CNHP has done um, incredible work across the state, producing some of the most in-depth data on Colorado's species. CNHP is a provider of a lot of high quality data um, to here at CSU, as well as other partnering organizations. And one of my favorite parts about CNHP is the work and relationships that they have with Warner College students, myself included in that. Um, Students at Warner College are able to make these connections with the faculty at CNHP, um, people who are highly knowledgeable, are knowledgeable and really skilled in this field. Just to plug CNHP even more, um, one of my favorite things that they do is this internship program for undergrads at Warner College. These interns are able to spend all summer working on various conservation projects from wildlife to vegetation studies and if you're in this field, you'll know how valu valuable that is to get that uh, plethora of skills in such a short amount of time. And another really cool thing that CNHP has done is this Codex um, creation here. So Codex, or Colorado's Conservation Data Explorer, was co-created by um, Colorado Natural Heritage Program and um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CPW. And this is a really awesome site I recommend checking out. It's uh, an interactive map explorer that plans conservation projects. You can run queries, you can submit them for review, and you can just really do a lot of work with um, data here in Colorado. And as Colorado faces increasing climate stressors, CNHP works hard to preserve biodiversity, restore habitats, and identify some, some of Colorado's most threatened ecosystems. Um, some of the work they do, they work in wetlands and they work in alpine ecosystems and rare plants. Then they have wildlife um, side of their projects um, in the zoology department, working with bats and herpetology, and of course, our small mammals. <laughs> so this project was led by our leader, um, Jeremy Seamers. Jeremy is a zoologist at Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And so he created this project. Um, it was presented as a grant from Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the, the purpose of learning more about um, one of Colorado's more understudied species, the olive back pocket mouse, um, hopefully updating. There's historical records um, of the mouse. A lot of them are 50, 60 plus years old. So just trying to get some more um, current data on where they're found in a more presence absence study. And later with that information, Jeremy's also going to make a distribution model, which will be cool. And it's important to note that this project was started in 2022 last summer, and that was taken on by Teretaka Funabashi and John Sobel. And then this summer, um, I had the pleasure alongside my coworker, Simona Mir, um, to take it on for this year. So I can't go forward in this presentation without thanking my coworker, Simona Mir. She's not on the call because she's outliving her best life in New Zealand, um, but I just wanted to mention her because we traveled all around Colorado together and this project would not be possible without her support. So another cool thing that CNHP has done, um, they are a part of the Nature Serve, Nature Serve Network. 
And this is an online website. Um, it's made up of 60 plus governmental and non-governmental organizations, including other heritage programs um, across the United States and Canada. And the NatureServe network is a great tool. It's making natural resource data more accessible to anyone who wants to log on and learn something. Um, if you type in paragonesis fasciitis, the, all the backpack mouse into the NatureServe network today, this is the map that comes up. Um, it's important to note that it was last updated in 2016. And the NatureServe network on some of their maps, they can list them as a conservation status. And you can see here in Colorado, for our species that is vulnerable. And once again, noting that a lot of these records are historical, this project is working on updating some of these records. Okay, so our socio-ecological system for my project, um, we did travel all around Colorado. So instead of doing the socio-ecological system of all of Colorado, I decided to focus on Moffitt County. This is in the Northwest corner of the state, right up near um, Utah. And this is a map of Moffat County. And uh, yeah, spoiler, we found them in Moffat County. So that's why I'm focusing on Moffat <laughs> County. Um, and if you're not familiar with socio-ecological systems, this is the frame of study in which you approach conservation topics. Um, you can approach wildlife issues with a systems lens, thinking about how humans and politics and culture and economy and climate change all impact each other. And they're these really complex systems. It's one of my favorite frameworks about approaching conservation issues because I think it does, um, it's complicated, but it does a good job trying to figure out all the different moving parts. So for Moffitt County here, um, just to put some context of this area, um, compared to the rest of Colorado, it is not very populated, um, it gets pretty sparse, but the biggest city is Craig. And like the rest of Colorado, they are facing an increase in population and more development. Um, it's important to know up here that a lot of this is BLM land, so owned by the Bureau of Land Management. And so that's open to the public for recreation, hunting. Um, one area we spent a lot of time in was Sandwash Basin. And Sandwash has a interesting conservation context going on there as well. It's a wild horse herd management area. So as well as being open for recreators, um, it's also conserving a herd of a few hundred wild horses. The predominant industries in Moffat County, um, agriculture is prevalent. There is some tourism along the Yampa River here. A lot of people pack uh, both that river. And then extractive industries are common up here, such as oil and gas. And then a major threat to Moffat County, um, like other ecosystems are facing, is climate change. As temperatures get warmer, especially here in Colorado, a concern is an increase in wildfire severities. There is natural wildfires in this um, Moffat County habitat, but as the climate changes, these can get more severe, and um, as well as a decrease in precipitation, this area already doesn't get a lot of precipitation. Um, so if that decreases or experiences some changes that may impact the habitat um, structure in that area. So our stakeholders, to be honest, going into this project, um, I didn't know if there would be tons of communication with other people, but in wildlife conservation, that is usually proven wrong. Um, it does involve people and so we got to work with a bunch of different agencies and one of them being in Dinosaur National Monument, um, got in contact, that's a, that's a National Park Service property. And then, like I've said, the BLM land, that's open to the public. Um, we did a lot of trapping on those properties. Colorado Parks and Wildlife being a major stakeholder in this project. Um, we did also get to trap on some state land. City of Fort Collins Natural Areas, um, we did some work um, on those properties. Douglas County open space down near Denver as well. We also got to um, foster some great relationships with some private ranches and landowners there. Shriver Space Force Base is a military base down in Colorado Springs. And we did some trapping there. Um, there's a cool wildlife work going on in the military bases that I wasn't aware of. And then the Forest Service land, Honey National Grasslands was visited last summer by Funa and John. So I wanted to do a bit of a biology about our mouse here. So 
Paragonesis fasciatus. They're in the family Heteromycida. This is alongside kangaroo rats and other species of pocket mice. And pocket mice are really distinct in that they have these um, cheek pouches that they fill up with seeds when they're foraging. Um, when looking up literature about this species, um, some of it is it's sparse, and but a lot of literature notes that they're found in this lo low density, kind of a solitary species. Simone and I found that to be true ourselves. Um, I have this quote from this 1965 paper uh, that I think gives a good insight into what I'm trying to say here. So Coit of uh, 1965 quoted, I made numerous unsuccessful efforts to find this mysterious pocket mouse in the sandy plains of White City in Pilot View. This points out the difficulty of determining the range of this interesting mammal, which is hard to track and often, often apparently of rare occurrence. Um, but from what we do know, they prefer dry, soft, sandy soils. They like that um, kind of high prairie grassland desert ecosystem with some sagebrush, um, as well as these native mixed grasses. So going into more detail on that habitat structure, um, this was a study done by Alberta Fishing Game, um, Gummer and Kiesner in 2004. And this is just a screenshot of the habitat suitability they found for all of back pocket mice. This is um, from their region, but I think it translates well here too. Um, they found that these pocket mice really prefer those soft soils. They noted having lacking some of those digging abilities uh, with their jaws and their claws, like some other species of small mammals have. So they really do prefer that soft soil that if you would pick it up, it would just like kind of crumble away in your hands. Um, sagebrush protection. Another thing that this species likes is having a good amount of bare ground. Um, just because if it's too dense, they they have like kind of a hopping style, so it'll like hinder their ability to move around. But then they also do like some sagebrush for as protection from avian predators. This is a soapstone area that we trapped in. Um, I think it's a little bit denser than the species would prefer, but occasional spots of bare ground um, to get around. So I wanted to uh, do an introduction into why it conserves small mammals, why study the olive back pocket mouse, why is that important? Um, with small mammals, they are found in a lot of ecosystems all over the world. Um, I'm sure everyone here today has probably seen a mouse maybe in their home, but out in the environment, um, small mammals play an important role in these predator prey relationships. And thinking about the food web overall, um, there's a lot of literature showing the relationship between small mammal populations and predator species populations. Um, I have a graph on the next slide that, that goes into more detail on this, but a lot of times if small mammals are doing well, you'll see like local owl populations also doing well, vice versa. If that uh, small mammal population is doing um, poorly, um, they also see predator populations doing poorly as well. So it's a really important relationship in a lot of environments. Small mammals are also a great indicator species of an overall health of an environment. Um, I did a study a couple of years ago back in New England, and this company was trapping for small mammals in these forests, looking for deer mice, basically to figure out just how the overall health of the forest. Um, small mammals a lot of times are impacted by sudden changes in the environment, um, and sometimes they are the first population to kind of feel those effects. So if there is like a sudden decline in deer mice in a forest where there's usually a bunch of them, that could indicate that there's something else going on in the environment. They also disperse seeds throughout their habitat. And then just thinking about um, biodiversity lens, um, it's important to conserve both the apex predators down to the small mammals, just so that these environments are more resilient if sudden change does come about. Um, considerations of small mammal studies. I was very curious into looking if there's been research done on the public's like willingness to pay for small mammal conservation. Willingness to pay is basically assigning like a dollar amount that a person is most willing to pay. So you can do that in um, a conservation lens and sometimes lesser known, maybe seen as less charismatic species, um, are sometimes more underfunded and it's more difficult to gain conservation funding compared to more known and charismatic megafauna like polar bears or something like that. 
Um, one way to conserve species like this is through the use of flagship species. Um, this is debated amongst biologists, but I think a flagship species for the olive back pocket mouse would be pronghorn antelope. Pronghorn are common out in Moffat County. They really like that habitat um, and they are a game species and they have their own conservation work going on. And by conserving pronghorn habitat, you would also conserve all of back pocket mouse habitat. And I had an interesting study that I read by Richardson and Loomis, 2009. And they were looking at the public's willingness to pay for um, wildlife species. And they found that overall, the public's willingness to pay has gone up for wildlife conservation. But a really interesting note of this study is that they were looking at attitudes and they noted that for species such as rodents um, or insects or roaches can kind of be grouped in together um, as kind of more of a pest. And they didn't see the willingness to pay going up for them. And then I can't talk about our olive back pocket mouse without talking about a more known species of small mammal, um, and that's Preble's meadow jumping mouse. And Preble's are, there's really awesome work being done at CNHP for them. And the reason why they are a little bit more unique, um, they are a federally protected, listed as threatened species. Um, and they really prefer riparian habitats. And here in Colorado, um, with this listing that puts more protection on a species compared to one that doesn't have that protection. Um, and sometimes that can cause some controversy because then there's more conservation restrictions, but it also leads to really awesome conservation results as well. And I just thought that was a cool small mammal case study to just bring up here. So here's that uh, graph I mentioned about the relationship of small mammals and um, predator species. And this was a study by Arana in 2006. Um, this was actually in Peru, but they looked at the response of house mice and burring owls. And the house mice are the dots here, the burring owls are the bars. Um, and you can see as the house mice do well, the burring owls are doing well, and then maybe reaching their carrying capacity going down. Um, I was on a study uh, a couple of years ago, and I was in a forest where there was a lot of oak trees, and we had an oak mast year, so oak trees mast every five years, and the small mammals, like, we had, like, record high capture rates. They were doing really well because they had a lot to forage on, and then other researchers in the area, um, they were studying coyotes. They told us that the coyotes were doing well, so it just is a good way to visualize this relationship going on in the environment. So I have an interactive part of the presentation because I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> these are all uh, Peregrinaceae species. These are all pocket mice found in Colorado. They're going to be the silky, the plains, and our olive bat. Um, I swear these are all different mice. And then if you just want to like take a moment to guess which one you think is the olive bat pocket mouse, you can hold up like a one, two, or a three. Um, okay. Look at Jeremy. <laughs> um, okay. So if you guessed two, good job. <laughs> um, this is the silky pocket mouse, um, Flavus. They were found down at Schriever Space Force Base in Colorado Springs. Here's our olive back pocket mouse, um, Fasciatus. This is out in Dinosaur National Monument. And Plains pocket mouse, Flavescence, found at Chico Basin Ranch, also down near Colorado Springs. The reason why I do this activity is to show the visual similarities between these pocket mice. Um, it's incredibly, I find it incredibly difficult, and I know other people do too, to I, uh, distinguish them with just your eyes. Um, all the back pocket mice are described as having kind of this brownish olive gray fur with a darker like mid dorsal band on their back, and then a yellow, yellowish line separating their back and their stomach and a little white ear patch below their ear. But this will make more sense um, very soon in this presentation, but I just wanted to show the difficulties in distinguishing these species when you're trying to identify them. In this study, we took genetic samples, so that's gonna be a really important player in this. Um, these genetics allowed like CNHP to really identify accurately um, the, all the back pocket mice instead of accidentally identifying um, silky or planes as all the back. Yeah. So this is a screenshot of these historical records I've been mentioning. 
Um, you can see there's records of them up in that northwest corner of the state in Moffat County, Fort Collins, Front Range area, trickling down through Denver and all the way down to Clarefino County. Once again, noting that a lot of these records um, are older and this project is just trying to presence absence update these results. So that's why we um, traveled around Colorado. This is a screenshot of a map that'll make more sense um, later on uh, with the colors, but I just wanted to show like where uh, Simone and I were sent um, as well as last year and why, just to try to mirror these same records in an attempt to update um, all of that pocket mouse today. So the methods of this study, um, Jeremy designed this study heavily dependent upon this 2019 paper by Harkins. It's a trap optimizing detection of rare small mammals. If you are in the niche interest of small mammal trapping, I highly recommend this paper. Um, it was, I think it's really cool. They used different kinds of common small mammal traps um, to see if certain small mammal species preferred certain traps. Um, and the reason why we based off this paper is because they did find all the back pocket mice. So we wanted to mirror what they did. Um, so when Simone and I would go to a location, we would set two grids. Um, this is uh, kind of in areas that were picked five kilometers or more apart, if we could. And the grids were 80 traps in a four by 20 like setting, and we did them about 10 meters apart. With the traps, we set them like three hours within sunset and within three hours of sunrise. It's um, really important to not let any small mammal overheat. And then we followed a four night trapping schedule, um, but it's important to note, if we did catch a suspected all the back pocket mouse, we would pick up the grid and move it somewhere else because it's a presence absence study. And then of all the captures, regardless of species, we took the sex and the age. And then for suspected all the back pocket mice, um, we took additional biometrics. So that is like the hind foot measurement. Um, we took total body length tail weight. And then we also took a UTM of every grid regardless. And then we took an exact UTM of um, areas or the exact UTM of a suspected all the back pocket mouse. And then the genetic sample was in the form of an ear snip. So it's a very small snip to one of their ears. And then we store that in 95% ethanol, which was later sent to the Denver Museum of Science to be tested. And then an important note for this study, all of us have been trained and experienced in the handling of small mammals. I know Simone and I take the health of wildlife very seriously. Um, yeah, and we just really, every indiv individual that we interact with, we take that to our hearts of utmost importance. So I wanted to show an example of what it would look like after trapping in a location. So Stone Prairie Natural Area is about 30 miles north of here along the Wyoming border. It's a city of Fort Collins property. And this is one of two locations that were trapped in 2022 and 2023. Um, so another, I guess here's our result. Um, we did find an all back pocket mouse in Lamar County. So that was exciting. And I just wanted to show how the different grids were spread out. Um, not all these are five kilometers apart um, due to like space limitations, but you can see that beforehand, trying to pick out that suitable habitat. And then once in person, Simone and I would spend quite a good amount of time driving around trying to pick what we thought would be the best habitat with the most likely success in finding an all back pocket mouse. And these are the traps that we used. Um, these are have a heart traps. I never used have a heart traps before this. I usually use Sherman traps. Um, and there's pros and cons to each. Sherman traps are collapsible and they are a lot easier to carry and a little less finicky when you set them up. But have heart traps have a huge pro in that the sides are open. Sherman traps have like, like closed walls. So there's definitely a higher chance of individuals overheating. Um, that's why we get up so early to check traps. Um, but in each of these traps, we put a little bit of polyfill. So just like fluff to keep them warm. And then bird seed mix was used as bait. Here are the results. So I'll break down this table, but then I also have an interactive map that I think will like be more visually appealing, um, especially if you're not familiar with these areas. 
But yes, yeah, so the 2023 results that we've gotten back so far, we found the olive backpack and mouse in Moffat County, and that's going to be Dinosaur National Monument, as well as Two Bar Springs, that was in that San Wash Basin area. We have our one Larimer County capture in Soapstone. These two at the bottom are also olive backpack and mice. His genetics results just came back a little bit later. And yeah, it's definitely interesting. And to mention 2022 results, we actually got those back halfway through this year. Um, and those areas that were trapped were predominantly down along Jefferson County, Douglas County, kind of like the eastern side of Fort Collins. Um, and all of those individuals came back as Plains pocket mice, um, despite those being like historical record areas. So that was definitely, I think, for everyone that on this project, we were like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, but still answers a lot of questions. And then being able to find them up in Moffat County was really exciting, as well as Lamar County. And I just had an interesting observations from the other two pocket mice. This is the silky pocket mouse, and that's the Plains. So Chico Basin Ranch and Shreveur Space Force Base um, did not find any all of that pocket mice, but they did find at Chico Basin Ranch, I thought it was interesting, each of the different grids, grid one and grid two, one had planes and one had silky, but at Shreveur, um, the grids were intermixed with the planes and the silky. Um, and I just thinking about the overall like interaction of these pocket mice, where these ranges overlap or where they're found, um, is just, I thought it was a, interesting observation. All right, so I'm gonna show you that map from earlier. I did make a story map for CNHP um, about the project. I really like writing and I really like education and awareness. So this was really fun to write. Um, I did a little bit of like storytelling in it. This will be on the website later. I did an about CNHP, which we've talked about as well as a study. Uh, there's some on. And then here we have this map from the beginning. And basically I put a point in all the areas that were visited, 2022 and 2023. Um, and then I wanted to put a picture of that habitat. And then for the colors here, green represents all the back pocket mouse was found with a photo of the mouse. And then yellow is pending genetics. So these genetics we're still waiting on. Definitely likely that that's going to be an all back pocket mouse because that's kind of the only pocket mouse in that area. So that'll be good. And then red is where we didn't find them. These are 2022 and 2023. Um, yeah, so I put photos of other small mammals that we found there. This is 2022. Here's our one up in Larimer County in Soapstone. And then West Bijou Ranch, those genetics are still pending. The 2022 results that came back from there were all Plains pocket mice. So I'm not sure if those are going to be all back pocket mice, but there's always a chance. Um, and then Horfano County, uh, this one, I think we're most excited about getting back because that's going to really connect that range and update um, an area that are supposed to have them. Um, so those will be exciting to get back. We did catch quite a few pocket mice there. Um, so we will have to wait and see. And then I'm going to try to get out of this. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Zooming in on our results a little bit more. Um, this is Dinosaur National Monument. There's a lot of historical records from this area of all the back pocket mice. Um, it's in the northwest corner of Moffat County and it's right along the Utah border. It's a really beautiful place, very remote. Um, and there were a lot of historical records along this Yampa Bench Road. So we kind of followed that. And we did find an olive back pocket mouse at each of these grids. I just think an important difference of this area is we only found one pocket mouse on each grid, if no other species of small mammal. Usually when we set a grid, we'll catch at least a few other individuals or a few other small mammal species. But out in dinosaur, each of these grids only had one mouse. Um, and they were all olive back pocket mice. And they were all on the first morning of the study, which also doesn't always happen. So yeah, interesting conservation going on there with those guys. And the these results, you can then look at the different soil layers and make some conclusions from that. They really like soft, sandy soil with a good amount of bare ground, like the literature had shown. 
and zooming in even more at each of these grids. So that one's from grid four, and that's their exact habitat structure. Um, once again, you can see that a uh, good amount of bare ground, mixed native grasses with the occasional sagebrush, and then grid one, same idea. These are like exact photos of the habitat where they were found. So just really, once again, trying to get more information on this species that's lacking um, some of this knowledge. Okay. So I wanted to include a list of other species captured of small mammals. This isn't super important to the olive back taco mouse study, but I had never trapped in Colorado for small mammals. And it was really exciting to get to see species that I had never seen before, uh, such as the kangaroo rat. The kangaroo rat was often found in habitats with the olive back pocket mice, which is interesting. And then the grasshopper mouse, some voles, other species of pocket mice, and then chipmunk. We also trapped, or we captured a rat at soapstone, which was very unexpected. I had never had that happen before. But just thinking of a broader system, how are these small mammals interacting? Where are they interacting? Where are they not? It's just an avenue, another avenue of thought um, for small mammals. And then going into the discussion. So finding that um, individual in Soapstone Prairie Natural Area, because that is our only capture outside of Moffat County, was really exciting. Um, I think it just suggests maybe more trapping along the Front Range, maybe some of these Fort Collins, Fort Collins areas. Um, it could be the proximity to Wyoming but also it was exciting to just find one in that historically um, all the backpack pocket mouse present area. Where Fano County, like I said before, getting those genetic facts are gonna be exciting. This is a photo of Fano County. Um, the habitat, like the soil is very soft. If you step in that, it's gonna leave a footprint. It's very sandy, um, good amount of bare ground, some sagebrush. And then there's one of the pocket mice we captured. Um, can't confidently say that it's an olive back pocket mouse, but um, I'm hopeful to see those results. And then just an area of best conservation for this species as of right now, I'd suggest Moffat County. They really um, love that habitat up there, like in this photo of Sandwash Basin. Um, they are prevalent out there, which was really exciting to get those results back. And it's definitely an area of high conservation interest for this species. And once again, making these like broader habitat conclusions for the mouse, um, good amount of bare ground, soft soil with some vegetation present um, for protection. And yeah, just thinking about their habitat needs going forward. So these historical records um, definitely begins to question if some of these historical records were identified as all back pocket mice when really they were silky and plains pocket mice. So there's a big room for more trapping and discussion to be had there because they are so visually difficult to determine without genetics. Um, yeah, if the specimen wasn't determined without genetics, it definitely can be raised some questions based on our findings because um, we really did try to follow these areas in hopes of trapping an olive back pocket mouse, but instead got planes and silky. So just taking genetics and being sure in identifications um, Jeremy and I talked about shifting range of the olive back pocket mouse. Could it be they're just not found there anymore, um, but found that to be pretty unlikely in that time. And then there's totally the chance that us researchers just didn't catch an olive back pocket mouse um, in those weeks that we were there. And then just thinking about the other pocket mouse species, um, fasciatus and flavus and flavescence, and where those species overlap and where they don't and where they interact and where they don't. Um, is another interesting avenue for this study. And then I mentioned at the very beginning about prebles and how they have their um, endangered species protection. And um, the olive back pocket mouse has a long way to go from that, but with small mammal conservation and thinking about different conservation avenues, going in more of like a legal way um, is another avenue of thought. So like any study, we did have our limitations, um, weather being a big one out in Moffat County. If you're out there and it starts raining, you definitely wanna get off the dirt roads because the soil there is like clay. 
So it'll stick to your tires, which we learned. Uh, and they'll just take your tires and you'll slip around. And actually the sign was put up two weeks after we had visited <laughs> and had gotten stuck. Funa can talk about this story, but we made it. it was fine. Um, but yeah, we had to kind of change our plans, um, which is okay. But yeah, they put that sign up and it is definitely true. So if there was like pretty bad weather for safety reasons, um, we wouldn't set traps, so that could change the number of trapping nights down in El Paso County. There was some crazy weather, just like really severe lightning and thunderstorms. It was a really, really wet spring and honestly summer if you were here. And some of those nights were just a little bit dangerous to set. Um, as well as the moon cycle, uh, literature shows that small mammal behavior and activity is heavily dependent on the moon cycle. So. If there's a bright moon, the night's going to be lighter, and then the small mammals are going to be more visible um, to avian predators or other predators. So we didn't trap around the moon, um, but that could be a consideration for small mammal activity. Mormon crickets are crickets found, um, especially up in the Moffat County northwest corner of the state. They like to emerge from the Yampa River, it seems like, and they are found, I don't know, they emerge like whenever they feel like it. it could be like once in 20 years, it could be once in five years. This was the year. Um, <laughs> I had never seen anything like it. And uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because in Dinosaur National Monument, um, like the olive back pocket mice, they seem to prefer to eat bird seed as well. So a lot of our traps in the morning would be like fresh out of seed or closed with like 15 crickets inside. Um, so it was fun trying to get them out. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So with the Mormon crickets also competing for the bird seed as well as all the back pocket mice, that definitely influences our study. Land access, we can only trap where we could trap. So there could definitely be all the back pocket mice in other areas. And then we did have some instances of missing and disturbed traps, um, especially down in Greenland open space. This is a property um, down near Denver. And we had a lot of the have a hard traps being tinkered with and like flipped over, pulled apart as well as two go completely missing, which I had never happened before. I've had issues with black bears in the past, but Simone and I were thinking maybe like raccoons. Um, there was a trail that ran kind of alongside where we set, but I don't know, I think that's unlikely, but yeah, if you set 80 traps, only 70 work, that's gonna um, change your probability of capturing what you're looking for. So recommendations for our study. Um, this all the back pocket mouse is exciting because there is so much more to do and learn about them with continued trapping, making sure we're taking genetics so that we're not accidentally identifying silky and plains pocket mice as the all the back pocket mice or vice versa. Maybe doing more of a density study, getting an understanding of a population size in these ecosystems. Um, conserving that Moffat County area is the best area of conservation for this species. You can take additional samples when you um, trap for small mammals, one of those being fecal. Um, fecal samples can give you an understanding of their diet and maybe how their diets change throughout seasons, as well as more structured habitat sampling. Simone and I took general observations of the vegetation and soil, but having more of a structured study alongside that would be cool. More trapping along the front range, especially because of that Larimer County sample. I know Jeremy has been talking about it, but just, yeah, getting more of an understanding of the olive back pocket mice in this front range area. And then, like I said, understanding where these species interact and where they don't, where the silky and plains and the olive back pocket mice kind of overlap. And then awareness and outreach. I am also an environmental educator and I love the awareness side of conservation. Um, and I think small mammal research has a great avenue of getting people involved in wildlife conservation. It's fairly understandable, easy to pick up, um, and it just gets people into this world of wildlife that you don't often get to see um, and really see these small critters that are all around us um, other than in your house, again. <laughs> so deliverables for this project, um, just overall that gathering of data, mapping it, looking at these habitat structures um, was really interesting. Jeremy allowed a lot of independence and leadership opportunities for Simone and myself in this project, and I really appreciate that. I've worked a lot of technician jobs, but I've never really been able to 
work on a project that just had so much freedom um, of different areas to go. And I definitely learned a lot from that. This report here is gonna go to Colorado Parks and Wildlife. It's very comprehensive. Simone helped me with the limitation section. And yeah, so giving that to CPW will hopefully help communicate this information. I did do a brief protocol for the study as well as that story map I showed earlier. So is the olive back pocket mouse rare or is the olive back pocket mouse understudied? The olive back pocket mouse is definitely understudied and there's a lot of room um, for the understanding of the species with these trappings and just taking those genetics and being confident in our identifications. Um, this species of mouse is definitely going to hold a special place in my heart. Um, it was a lot of fun this summer being out there. And yeah, I'm just really excited to see where research goes for this species of small mammal. Like I said at the very beginning, small mammals are very important in our environments and in our ecosystems. And sometimes when I think about why are we not to conserve wildlife species, um, if you think about biodiversity, there may be interactions in the environment that the olive back pocket mouse is doing that we don't even know about. And I think that in and of itself is a reason to conserve them. So personal reflections for this portion of this presentation. Um, yeah, I just feel very privileged to get to work in this field. Um, just interacting with all these different wildlife species um, is really special. I've always had a fascination for little critters like bugs and toads and salamanders, you can ask my mom. <laughs> um, but yeah, so getting to see like the tiny world is always exciting to me. Um, and yeah, I think in wildlife conservation, CLTL has helped me think about my role in this like human and wildlife relationship, human and wildlife research. And I really want to take that with me um, into everything I do. And I wanted to know one of the best parts of the summer. Going into it, um, I was a little bit nervous because it was gonna be over 105 every day. Um, so I was a little bit grumpy about that because I don't love the heat, um, but I was quickly proven wrong. We got to spend time in Dinosaur National Monument. If you can ever go, I highly recommend. Um, it is just, you feel like you're at the edge of the world um, and the night sky is just beautiful. And I just feel, once again, very privileged to get to research in these areas. Um, another note of wildlife conservation that CLTL has definitely brought to more of the forefront of my mind is when we do this kind of research, we are going on other land, we are visiting stolen land, and I just think it's important that we keep that in the front of our minds. Um, there's a lot of just, you can tell there's a history and a story in these places. Um, and I feel honored to add a tiny drop of research on all of Backpack and Mouse um, to an area like this. And just to conclude my reflections, um, it was an awesome summer. There are definitely challenges at times. Um, field work will always do that. And I don't know, it really just pushes you as an individual, um, even when you are really tired, just making sure that everything you're doing is with intention. Like I said at the beginning, Jeremy allowed a lot of freedom and leadership in this project. And I really appreciate that opportunity and just seeing where it went. Um, yeah, and overcoming those obstacles, um, I really feel like I had to hold myself accountable and taking care of myself this summer alongside the research. And yeah, and then another important reflection from this study, um, since I interacted with one person, mostly the whole summer, um, and that was Simone. We spent every hour of every day together, and that could go really bad, but it ended up being awesome. And I think um, we, I definitely got lucky, but it also did come with work. Simone and I were very upfront with each other at the very beginning of like, this is what I need, this is what I want, like, this is like the space I need, and just really respecting each other's boundaries. Um, and I want to bring that into like more collaborative relationships I'm, of course, going to have in the future. Um, and once again, really thinking about my role as a conservationist um, in wildlife, especially, and just being really thoughtful about my interactions um, in these types of ecosystems. And I have a lot of thank yous, but I'll quickly go through them because um, they are very important. Tina Jackson, I never met, but she was our Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, grant provider. So this um, 
study really needed that, obviously. And then Katie Fitzgerald is the wildlife biologist at the Air Force and Space Force Base. Um, she went above and beyond and welcomed Simone and I into her home as well for a couple of weeks out of the summer, which is such a treat after a long day in the field. Um, I'm just really thankful getting to spend time with her and her dogs. Um, and she's just an awesome wildlife biologist. So super fun getting to talk to her. And then Alin over at the City of Fort Collins Natural Area, she was our contact for those, um, or at least for one of our properties. And she also went above and beyond. She even helped us set some traps. Um, so that was awesome getting to meet her. And Hugh at the um, Douglas County Open Spaces, he was incredibly thoughtful and really helpful in making that week work. Cannon Bennett at West Bijou Ranch, he drove us around the property and allowed us to use his facilities and we're really thankful for him. Duke Phillips at Chico Basin Ranch always checked in on us at the end of the day, which I appreciate. John Dembowski, he's the scientist and geneticist at the Denver Museum of Science. So this project and these results would not be possible without him. And then our Dinosaur National Monument contact was Emily Spencer. And then I had to shout out our camp host, Dell. He was so kind and he gave us cold Gatorades at the end of every day. Uh, so and I were spoiled. <laughs> And then, of course, I have to thank all the people, everyone at Colorado Natural Heritage Program, um, but certain people, of course, and Jeremy Seamers, um, our leader. Sloan and I would sometimes call with all sorts of news, and Jeremy always keeps like a nice level head, and he's just an incredible leader um, for this project. And Funa for training us. Um, if you know Sloan and I, it seemed like chaos kind of followed us. Um, and Thuna is just so awesome, and I really look up to him as a biologist, and I cannot wait to see everything that he accomplishes. And then Dave Anderson at CNHP, he is the director. Um, he was my first contact as a student here, and he was like, oh my gosh, yes, let's do something. And if you know Dave, you know just like how um, incredible he is as a leader, and he really has made such an awesome working environment at CNHP. And then Susan, um, also one of the first people I met at CNHP and she's just so kind and warm and I just feel super um, privileged to get to work with these people. Simone Amir, if I haven't said it enough, um, I'm really thankful for her and I'm excited to see everything that she accomplishes. My CLTL peers, my cohort, cohort 12, um, no one gets it like the people that are going through it. So I'm really thankful for all of you. My professors, um, they pushed me to think about conservation in a whole new lens. Sometimes it's more complicated, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm really thankful for all the different things and ways they've pushed me. And to my mentor, Ashton Lamb from this program, he also pushed me to find a project that I loved. So I'm really thankful for that. Dawson and Brett, um, this program would not be possible without them. You can really see it in everything that has been shown today. Um, Really, really thankful for all the work that they do. And then I have to mention the people that came before CSU because a lot of them I know have logged on. Um, and that's my University of New Hampshire professors and EcoQuest um, professors as well. You guys were the first people that showed me that there's an entire world of conservation and where I wanted to go with it. So thank you. And then to my, my partner and friends for supporting me and sometimes really weird jobs and working with mice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Here's the citations and questions. Thank you.